Hey, hey, welcome. Welcome to Inside the Firm. How's it going? I believe this is episode 10. Do I have that right? I think it's nine because zero. We had zero. Okay, so technically 10. Technically but 10. This is, but this is actually But realistically, nine. you are wrong. Uh, welcome to everybody who's new to the podcast. Uh, welcome to everybody who is now uh, kind of a follower. and Veterans. Uh, yep, and veteran, a veteran of Inside the Firm. Yeah. Um, every week, this is just a raw inside look at our firm, F9 Productions, out of Longmont, Colorado. Well, we're an architecture and real estate, now newly real estate development firm. Um F9 Productions, sponsored by. Sponsored by. Uh, <laughs> so I'm here with, uh, my name is Lance Psycho. Uh, my co-host is Al, Al Gore. Hey. Uh, uh, it goes by Al Gore just so we can get the media attention. And uh, Or my friends in high school refuse to call me anything but Al Gore. Exactly. I've got several nicknames for him, but, yeah. that's, but that's pretty nice. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> well, a couple things that we do, uh, just as a refresher to anybody, is uh, we go through some past experiences. Uh, we're, a young, we're a young firm. We're only eight years old. But uh, really just only took off the last couple couple years. Before that, we were just barely making it and surviving in the Great Recession. So we, we tell about uh, just experiences that we've had as, as people who had little to no experience um, really doing projects on our own to taking and swinging for the fence and stuff like that. And then we um, a new feature that we've been doing is we've been going through uh, and asking other podcasters. Uh, this episode will feature Mark LePage of the Entree Architect uh, podcast. Uh, and community, and he's going to give us his reaction to um, his best and worst advice. Yeah, last last uh, episode was uh, Evan Troxel. Thanks, thanks again to that. Um, he's been great to partner with um, for the content, sharing, and everything. Uh, and then the last thing we talk about is our development talk. So as I mentioned, we're sort of this new real estate development firm, and we're working on a condo project, eight condos, and our own office, hopefully, uh, here in Longmont. And uh, we try to share. DIY development talk for that. Yep. Um, so that kind of segues right into our, our first topic, which is basically going after bigger projects than maybe your britches, you know, too big for your britches. Too big for your britches. Yep. Biting off more than you can chew. Yep. And I think some people, um, actually our first residential project, I think we got accused of that um, because we weren't licensed architects. So some people would, would have the purpose perspective that we weren't big we weren't supposed to go after anything um and and just so just so it's clear <laughs> in the state of colorado you do not have to be a licensed architect to do residential work up to certain levels and we we've never solicited for that stuff blatantly um as unlicensed architects now we're licensed architects well one of us is one person uh, is one person is trying really hard really really hard <laughs> 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 I wanted to bring that up today. <laughs> I didn't I'll, know how you felt I'll about go. bringing that up. So I, th- I just, I took three Ta- tests in a row. Tangential rant here. I took three tests in a row. Um, I do not advise that. I studied for two months and then decided to take three tests. I just got the res- uh, um, results. I got results for the PPP, which I thought, man, I, I failed the questions. Like this, is, the questions came out of nowhere. The, the, the scope is so huge. Nope, did not fail the questions. Somehow failed the vignette which seems absolutely crazy to me. And I think I know, I think I know what actually happened because there's levels. So a level one is, hey, you pass. Level two is like, oh, you're so close. And if you only get one of those, you'll, you'll probably pass. And level three was like, you are, you are a total failure. Go, go home, shoot yourself, go, don't even do, get a different job. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Barry, literally <laughs> dig dirt, put your head in it <laughs> and stay there. Was your baby ashamed of you? Oh my, no, that's that's the only thing keeping me by saying me saying is that he still loves me. He doesn't Aww. care. Um, so I got a three on on the vignette, and and some of you and might three not is know, bad. Just so everyone knows, terrible. Um, it's very simple. I do a lot of planning. Like we all- <laughs> well, this is what blew my mind about uh, Alex failing the test was th- exactly that. Is I said, Alex, you're the one that always knows what we can and cannot do zoning wise. And yep. I'm always the one that knows what we can and cannot do construction wise, like the complete opposite of the spectrum. Yep. So I'm like, you, what are you doing with your life? So so it, it, it's crazy because I do this for so many projects. We have developments. It, it, it's sort of my bread and butter, not a big thing. And, and basically what you do is you put the setbacks, you put the building envelopes, and then you do a section of it, right? And, I, and, I, and, and you said, I didn't know this, like three is basically a fatal error. Yeah. Um, meaning... Did you go look that up after I told you that? You must No, have. no. Nope, I just believed you. Okay, well. So I think I know what I did. So there was this tree line, and to, to you're supposed to be 25 feet away. And normally I do like 
I do the circles, but I don't do as many circles. Basically, you make a circle so that you can be right. 25 feet away. The problem with being 25 feet away is that it only you can only type in radiuses. So 12 foot 6 is not an option. So I had to do 13 foot, right? And normally I do like just a decent amount of, of circles and then like I connect the lines and it, it's pretty good. But all the examples, these people do like millions, millions of circles. Yeah, like, right? like I did when I passed on my test seven and seven months. Thank you very much. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, you failed one. You fa- let's be. I did fail one. So I, sorry, I took eight tests in seven months and passed, passed them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think what my fatal error was is that you can't have your building go past your construction envelope. Right. And what I did is because it was so like weird, loose, like, loosey goosey with your circles. Nope. Oh. The circles were fine. Is that okay? I was trying to get really close to the circles because I didn't want to, because I knew there was a tolerance. So, um, I would make, a, I made a bunch of points where in all my practices I'd make like, you know, like for going around a circle, like maybe eight points. And then on this one, I made like maybe 20 or 30. So then the building could go right up close to the where you could construct so i bet you at one point one of my dots went the building one went outside the construction one and they're like that's it you can't be an architect (laughs) (laughs) nope nope (laughs) of course there's no way anyone would use a software this flawed but no you can't be an architect no the software is so awful so i bet you it came down to like computer like oh he went outside the (laughs) he colored outside the lights yeah Yep. Exactly that. Isn't yeah. that crazy? Are you convinced that that's probably? Yeah. No, I know for a fact. You made you made one stupid fatal. F- f- literally, that's what they call it—a fatal error. Yeah. And, and you messed up. So I made one fatal error too on BDCS. I think that's the one where you design a building. Uh, I trap people in a building because I instead of uh, instead of making like a doorway. F- crossing through the stairway or something like that, I only had a doorway coming out of the stairwell. So really bone. Yeah, you really, didn't. You really didn't have really an exit. It's, uh, on the st- stairwell, yeah. Exactly. No, no. I had an exit stairwell to ex- to exit, so you could go you could go down the stairwell yep. and you could exit, but from that internal corridor, you you couldn't go through like cross through the landing of the staircase. You know what I mean? There wasn't a clear path. I don't really bonehead move like what? That's that's our that's being an architect one hundred and one. Uh, yeah, like draw. this, like this, like this. And I'll so, describe. So he's drawing a box. Drawing a stair, right? Yep. Scissor stair. There, he drew a stair. Like, oh, I come down this stair, and I can come out the door this way, right? Yep. And then if this is my internal hallway, I don't know, for some reason I said they didn't have to go, that didn't have that door. I I don't know. It was a really bonehead mood. Oh, you just just missed the door. I missed the door. It was an absolutely idiotic move. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, I would have, for sure, seven to seven months. Yeah. Okay. Hilarious. <laughs> and again, again, so obviously they went away from the vignettes, probably for like these very weird reasons. Um, but for it, this, re- I think these reasons specifically. Yeah. And that p- so many people complained about the clunky, clunky software that they had you use when we're using like the most sophisticated pieces of software in the world right now to do buildings, you know? Yep. So I'm wondering, have you ever been surprised at how rational some people are and how unrational other people are? And I'm talking about in government. No. So I've never been surprised at this. Okay. Well, yeah, everyone. Yes, I, I have been surprised at this because sometimes I start giving people the benefit of the doubt. Like, oh, they all think they all think rationally like me. But then nope, emotion comes in and just wipe it off the map. OK, I'm going to talk about Boulder County. I'm going to call you out Boulder County. So I called them because we're doing a deck. And I said, hey, I want to get a fast permit because they're going to have a wedding on it. And like maybe and I, I basically proposed, could we get our deck permit? Will that go faster? And we're doing some alterations to the house. And I go, then can we do that? later right and then she's like well you mean city of boulder not boulder county yeah city of boulder yeah then she goes into the weeds make sure that your engineer calculates the um a full wedding party on that deck oh my god you, like, why did you say full wedding party why did you i didn't men- say full wedding party. no no but you why did you even mention wedding party because well, because and well you didn't know you shouldn't have said that but you shouldn't have said that <laughs> no, but this is what's weird is because like hey this is why we want it we want it you know for the uh, but but what's weird and what we're gonna i'm gonna write a letter and then our that's like an tour. assembly level load at that point but what's so dumb is that there isn't gonna be a full wedding on the deck like you don't dictate how a wedding is is laid out there might be the bride and the groom and, a, and a, the priest or, or whatever and then like the uh bridesmaids and stuff so that's what eight ten people that's a normal load on the deck. 
they're not going to be stacked on the deck. So like you city, you just assumed something and now made up a standard that isn't a real standard. So like, again, you're, you surpri- could, yeah, you could fight that. I think. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think we'll be fine. But that surprised me at how crazy they are. Longmont surprised me how uncrazy they were when I went, when they said, Hey, we need a fire aerial road that would have eliminated one of our buildings. And I said, Hey, we're going to do this, this, this. And he's like, okay, that's fine. No problem. Um, and then I emailed him and said, you said this. And he goes, yep, that's fine. Oh, good. We got it in writing. <laughs> that's, that was honestly my next question. Are you, are you sure you got that in writing? Yep. Yep. So got that in writing, but where was I going with this? So this is, so two spectrums, like one, are you going to be crazy or are you going to listen? Like, are you a person at the other end of that email or that conversation that can see rational? So what I'm going to is because I don't know in Colorado if you can challenge, but you can challenge in your jurisdiction. And I want to lay out that scenario. Challenge the vignette on the test that yep. Alex took. And then say, hey, if that was the fatal error, do you recognize that this software has a fatal flaw? And then also that no one would choose to use this software and that that error would not occur in the real world. And then if you take away that error, would I have passed the vignette? And just take a look. <laughs> take a look. See what happens. <laughs> and then I'm sure not the, they'll say some big response back like, <laughs> We have verified that the way that we, you know, grade people is correct and blah, blah, blah. And we will not give you any information. You know, and they'll say it nice. Uh, <laughs> but basically, we ain't telling you shit. Yeah, Go yeah, screw yeah, yourself. Yeah. Oh, we're explicit on this one. <laughs> yeah. right. um, or would they be surprised? Actually, yeah. We, you know, like, <laughs> that makes total sense. You pass. <laughs> Just to recap, too, the whole time Alex thought, there's no uh he there's no way he pa- there's no way he didn't pass the vignette there uh, yeah and then there's no way no no he- no i i thought i did pass the vignette yeah and there's no way i passed the question exactly and yeah even so the the two months and then tr- three tests in a row um also on i just gotta i gotta defend myself a little bit i have a newborn baby who doesn't like to sleep on a schedule too so like this is a not recommended path to go i t- yeah it is what it, I'm not even going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I told you that, too. I, what was hilarious about, what for me, what's so hilarious about this whole experience, like, uh, yes, I wish Alex would have passed because I want another license in the office because then our insurance goes down. And it's just better all the way around. I do think you learn a fair amount from... The study the, board the is study. not bad. It's just the way that they word the questions. Yeah, and the, the questions and, are awful. And how, how... Like, the metric is awful, I think, for, yeah. for testing. And how protectionism they are. Like, and, and they even say that they're not here to teach you, which is ridiculous. Like... Okay, you, to be a licensed architect, what do you need to know? Like, li, why why not let people know? Or else, well, you, actually, you, I'll play devil's advocate here, and I, th- do. I I think they have a point because I've I've always said this too. I go, I'm trying to see both sides of the coin, right? Yep. So if I see their side of the coin and I say, ah, yeah, yeah, maybe you guys are only a testing metric, and it's not your responsibility to teach anybody. Well, then I think, hmm, isn't it the university's responsibility to teach everybody? So why can't we be just like um, lawyers or or engineers when they come out of school that they are basically test ready, especially lawyers too, because you can take the bar right after grad school, law school. So why why aren't the universities preparing uh, students to be able to take the test? Like if if our alma mater offered, uh, first of all, if you were able to if you were able to test right out of right out of school, like let's say you get your master's or your professional bachelor's degree to be an architect. Why can't you at that point, via that degree and not the stupid hourly requirement, start to take the test? I'm not saying take the architect the hours away. I'm saying you still have to do the hours, and you, but you could at least take the test. And then what if there was an extra semester? Or in grad school, they just included it. And that's what they're doing. There's six test schools that are doing that. Oh, really? Yeah. Which the, ones are these? I think one in California. One, one like... They're really starting that? Yeah. Is this brand new? Like a year. Oh, You're that's like awesome. Year. Well, there you go. They must have heard yeah. me through my brain. Exactly. It was, it was all you. It was all you. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question though. So um, when I was there, I was talking to some people while we were waiting and there was a couple doctors there. And did you know that they take tests? The doctors? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I thought, I said, hey, I'm sorry. I thought you were just a doctor after medical school. I just thought you were, you know? And so what they do is they take three levels of tests, one, two, three, and you do some of them while you're in school and some of them w- afterwards. So like the level three, you're basically, you already graduated as a doctor. You're called a doctor, but you still got to take your level three, right? Level one and two, you're still in school. 
And I have to imagine it's this way. So there's probably some, they have their own end carb, whatever it's called. And they have, you know, a level one, a level two, a level three. Okay. And, and they, they know what they're testing on. So like, imagine like, oh, okay, you need to, um, scope out someone's knee for what, whatever. Somebody reason, comes right? in with this problem. How do you solve it? Yep. Blah. What? Yep. Yep. So the people who are establishing that then say, okay, there has to be best practices because you can't get sued. And this is, this is doctor stuff. So, right. We need to kind of have like the answer. So then that board, and I want a doctor to kind of come and tell me probably says to the universities, like, Hey, make sure you're teaching this. Mm. And every two years, like, so, Hey, right. this is the scope. So there's some communication. This is what's yeah. going on. So yeah. like there, the, the, I, sw- it would be negligence if doctors did not do that. So NCARB doesn't say, Hey, all these other testing and this entities or the schools they don't say make sure this is the procedure when you're uh, you know analyzing a site when you're looking at the program because there are questions about you know uh basically programming and and there's like six steps blah blah blah. are they communicating what those are to all the universities no they're not so like yes you aren't teaching the individual people but there has to be this up and down where you need to teach the people who are teaching the people or else it's it's literally a crapshoot and, and what are most professors concerned about in architecture school? Teaching, D- design, 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 exactly. Which I also think is, ugh, I think it's, I think it's so important to be a good designer. I think nailing a floor plan and making it so that it's, I don't, there's no other word that I can think of right now, but like timeless in the sense that we're not having to knock down walls, maybe in a, maybe even in like two or three years because it, the the spatial layout is so awful, right? What I'm going, where I'm going is, I've always wondered. So why aren't we teaching? Um, why aren't we offering some kind of courses then in design school where they also start teaching back like how can we how can we teach these people and enable them to also be developers or like be sort of in charge of how the the money works on the end on on, on design design projects where they're doing their own developments because then i think they can they're not going to be dictated you know if they're if they're in control of the cash flow and they understand the budget from 100 percent, then maybe they can control the design and everything so so then all the design teaching comes back through and we end up with more good designs because not everything is dictated by the cheap developers, right? And not all developers are cheap. I'm just saying, man, I feel like that component is missing from school. I think it could help a lot. Well, I think I think this is going to self-correct itself with with the schooling because now you have a structure in place. With these like six schools you're talking about? With these six schools and then it'll become all schools, right? Okay. Because right now we have no – people are sitting there and just complaining on the internet and basically saying like, what is going on? Why, you know – NCARB's not doing, and NCARB is just pushing back because they get <laughs> probably so many of this. All they can say is no, 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 because they don't have any probably real answers to yeah. it. Yeah. Right. And then <clears throat> the testing people, they're just trying to, I mean, the people that are teaching Kaplan, like they're just trying to be in the middle and trying to do the best that they can. Right. But th- they don't have any structure really down to the people learning and they don't have any communication up to the, you know, other people. So now when you're in school, you're going to have professors that are teaching a whole bunch of kids. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the kids are going to say, go back to the professor and be like, wow, that had no correlation to what, what, <laughs> what you're teaching us. <laughs> like some of it did, but like it, it, it's honestly crazy. And, and the professor would, you know, finally, like probably after a semester or two, be like, okay, like I really got to look into this and be like, oh, okay, wait, there's no communication. There's no whatever. And, you know, like it's not working. And then a couple of professors who are teaching these at the universities will gang up and be like, how can we do this better? Because like, we don't want horrible reviews. We don't want students thinking that our We don't want horrible is, reviews. Honestly, that's a giant metric. In yeah. And we don't want people thinking our college is SHIT. You know, especially yep. if it, they're these big colleges, right? Like, how, how are you going to pay thousands of dollars and for the professor to say, like, oh, this may or may not be on the test. We have no idea. Kind of. They change it all the time and they ask you 20 questions that don't really count just to kind of <laughs> get it down to 75% so that they can keep a cap on it and narrow it on questions that are quite confusing. Like, <laughs> so now you have, like, 100 <laughs> students per class and then you have, like, five professors that are like, NCARB, get out of here. Get you need here. to make this, yeah. you know, we need to design something where you need to let us know you need to at least let us know see behind the curtain or you know so i mean it might take five ten years who knows how we should get a hold of somebody at one of these six universities and see if we can get them on a, a skype interview that would be cool we should oh god i, was I just say. hear the i would love to hear how they're implementing it i would love to hear if they have an interaction like you're saying with ncarb because what if what if you're what if you're assuming on a false premise that there's going to be this up and down when really it's they're still separate things 
It's just that they're igno- they're like looking at each other through a window. <laughs> hey, Bob. <laughs> hey, <Brooke. laughs> Dude, I don't know. These students are really pissed at me. Well, you know, we're not here to teach. We're not here to teach. <laughs> we're just here to test you. <laughs> anyway. All right, that was a huge. There's tangent. such a disconnect now. I'm sorry. There's such a disconnect because NCARB, NCARB's uh, <clears throat> defense is that we get feedback from professionals to them. So like, it, it's like they're behind a veil, but they're like, oh, these professionals are giving us this feedback. How many people? Okay, speaking of the feedback, so you know the questions you get at the end of the tests. Yeah. What? Do, do, how many people do you think actually answer? I was not prepared for this test. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's weird. such a weird question. So, so just so everybody, every, everybody, a lot of people listening probably have already taken their test. But people who haven't, or maybe are thinking about doing the students, I don't know. They ask you this question at the end of the test, and they say, "Do you think you were prepared for this test?" That, and you're so paranoid at that point, and you just start to get like conspiratorial with your thinking, and like, well, I don't know, should I answer this? I don't know. It's just, it's just a mind game. I, I think you should be conspiratorial because I think, <laughs> I think there is that that kill kill switch or whatever yeah and if you do you know just like just just the idea that there's something if you do it you're automatically wrong you know because what what if you're what if your example everything else was basically the perfect the best thing you could ever do and then you know in an office like i would see the plans or building official would see the plans or like perfect perfect example you come back to the plans multiple days because you work on projects for months and And there's no and you see something yeah Exactly. See something, say something. So like you wouldn't make that mistake in the firm. Yeah. So yeah. So the whole fatal error thing in those tests, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I, I see the point for him, but I also see, I see what you're getting at here. Like mm, there's fatal errors that happen in the field. Perfect example. So there was a house that we did, uh, in Broomfield, I think recently, I probably almost, it's probably almost finished. I did the structural drafting for it. The engineer and I missed that there was supposed to be a six inch void form underneath the grade beams. And we showed a four inch but the contractor caught it. Now he threw a big fit about it. Thank God he caught it in time. But like I don't know, that could have been a fatal error. So, but it got caught. I mean, yeah. And it is what it is. It is. It is. It is. Okay. What it is. Not for the tangent. Sorry about that. Oh, that was. I'm it. not yeah. sorry about that. That was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> so, talking. Uh, one of the thing. One of the point. One of the things we wanted to talk about today was getting hired for doing projects that that stretch stretch your limits. So. Um, if anybody, we've, we've been hired multiple times, like Alex said, even when we were first starting out, uh, like one of the du- that duplex projects, I think we are, we've already talked about in another episode, the client for that one said like, well, you guys aren't licensed architects. Uh, how many houses do you have built? You know? So when we had to convince him that, you know, don't worry, it won't be a mistake hiring us. And it wasn't a mistake. You know, you know, he loves us and we love, everybody loves the building. It's even been copied and stuff like that. But how does it, how does that stretch your ability? So Alex Alex headed up one of the bigger projects in our firm or several projects where we've been hired and we're sort of fish out of the water. So I wanted to ask him, like, what are some of the things, what are the big points you, would you advocate for doing that? Like if somebody else is starting a firm or they're just breaking off or whatever, or even if they've had a firm for a while and then they get approached to do say a school, I've never done a school. Like, should you jump in? What kind of advice would you give them? So I got this advice from a contractor buddy up in, uh, on my, up in Montana and he said if they ask if you can do it you say yes <laughs> so we've always taken that approach and yes there's always been problems but there always will be problems so one of these big projects um, 24 units very complicated site programming zero lot line setbacks um, FARs uh, all this stuff that relates directly to a vignette <laughs> <laughs> that I happen to nail and get through <laughs> very stringent uh, city in this town that everyone in, in this uh, uh, <coughs> state. Just, yeah, just jurisdiction. Yeah. So he, here's what's, I think people have this false idea that there's these experts out there. And there are experts, but we're even talking to... But nobody knows everything. How about that? Yeah. We are talking to one of our mentors and we are going through a bunch of issues on this project because there's very complicated things like, I, I wouldn't say too complicated. You just got to take everything piece by piece interpret it, you know, apply it, maybe ask some questions. And everybody knows that, well, not everybody knows, but 
Um, everybody should know that uh, if they don't already that like the code is interpreted differently by everybody. I mean, people can make art like architects can make their own argument. Even if you're a homeowner, you can make your own argument. Like the city can make your own argument. So that's what he's saying by taking it piece by piece. I think is all these code issues, you know, come up and you go, oh man, we could do it this way, we could do it that way. Let's see what the city says, you know. Yep. So. <clears throat> Um, basically there will be learning lessons, but we took it and it was great because, um, it allowed us to kind of be bigger than we were. It, it, it was a huge project. So like it was a steady flow of money for a while, um, huge headaches, massive headaches, but you, you got to get your lumps. And the, our mentor said, because we were asking him questions about it and he goes, Hey, this other big firm out of Denver, a huge firm out of Denver that does a whole bunch of this. He goes, every time. This is what you have to understand. He said that to Lance and I, every time one of these projects gets done, you revisit it from like a fresh perspective, like from the ground up because cities change codes. Um, you might be doing it in, in Denver versus Lakewood versus Aurora versus, and they all have their little nuances. So the, exactly. Even the subcontractors and, or the general contractors might have a different, uh, system construction system that they like to use. And it's somehow, somehow they claim that it's cheaper than doing it the way you've been previously doing. And, all those kind of things. Yep. So, and then you, you, it's, we didn't get the next commission on this project because basically that was the approach I wanted to say is like, no, we are starting from scratch again. Like we are starting over all lessons learned are applying. So that's why the fee is going to be basically equal to the last fee because the product is going to be better. The, the, the construction cost will be down because we implemented all these things. So we had to redesign it from scratch using all those. Whereas things. the developer thought, Oh, cool. We figured it out. Let's just copy and paste right over there. Alex was like, nope. Even because Alex is even advocating for modeling the project uh, in a completely different way inside 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 of our software, our design software. So yep. instead of having so many links and, and stuff like that. We yeah, yeah, yeah. that was our lesson <laughs> lesson learned, which I'll talk about later about Revit links. Why, why we try to not do them even for like the condo project we're working on. We're just modeling everything all in one and we'll just deal with it. Yep. So this huge firm has the same issues and they probably charge a little bit more and they should have a little bit more experience, right? So that was comforting. Then this other developer is doing a project, um, a bigger project that we, we might take over after site plan review, but it's 80 units, right? And they're having a, a bigger firm go through site plan review, which is basically the hugest part of it. CDs are not even the biggest part because you basically have to design the whole building and, and having it, you know, working for site plan review. And the, and I was, I've been in meetings where the guy leading it for that firm is sitting there. He's older than me, more experienced. He's sitting there asking me questions and like, I'm telling him about, you know, okay, IBC versus IRC versus what this is going to be, the ramifications, what you need to present to the city, just listing everything out. Um, and that, that did came from experience, but I was like, holy cow, I know a whole bunch about this. And it was an aha moment for you for sure. Yep. And it was, it, it was, it was just crazy because I was like, man, this is a big firm doing big stuff. And like, it would be way better suited for our small firm. Like we would just knock this out of the park. So, uh, I think take take those leaps, um, but here's a here's the devil's advocate. Is there a leap too big? You know, um, is there a project that you would say don't do, or is it hey if there is a big project that's too big, you have to realize that you have to change your structure for it because if you think about um, big, so big he's what forty something like that. Um, he was doing big projects right away, right away. And I'm pretty sure he did not know all the codes and the details and, and all that stuff. And it's at Liebskin too. I'm, I'm sure, sure Daniel Liebskin is a smart, brilliant guy, but there was, there was code guys in there. There was people who knew, you know, like when, when the people from Seoul Korea came and sat down with their big whole binders, like I just walked past that meeting and saw one of the guys in there that knew the code and they had a big, I'm like, that looks terrible. Yeah. I am sticking out of that. meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so is there, so, yes. So then it's like, do you just hire one of those guys that knows it and incorporate that knowledge into your firm here? I'll I, I, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I think, I think if you, and so uh, to Alex, to answer Alex's probably redundant question is uh, rhetorical, not redundant, rhetorical is, uh, would, is there a project you would, we'd never take on? So we, we actually just, uh, we were not commissioned for a project that we didn't want to take on. And it, and for me, it was exactly those reasons because I thought, man, I just don't, I just don't feel like we're qualified. So it was a condo project 
and everybody hears the word condo and then they think litigation and that's what we think too even though we're doing them but so two two big red flags three red flags came out uh, were came went off in my head when we were asked to put a proposal for this project yes it would have been it would have been it would have been huge for our firm because again it's a, it was a big contract and we would probably have been able to expand again but the three red flags were number one i, I know the client work, work with, worked with them before they're a little aggressive with their time schedule and that added stress to us also tackling this development project i just thought man that seems like competing interests and then number two lit, litigation if we're not if we're not in charge of the hoa that sounds terrible um, because we're not the developers and, you know, condos are prone to litigation against architects. And number three, yep. especially stack condos. Ours, yeah, I think, are a little bit safer because they're... They're townhomes. Yep. Yep. Essentially, they're townhomes, but they're, we sold as condos. So anyway, the third one, the third one was, dang it, I lost my train of thought. The third one was, oh, that uh, they wanted to use post-tension slabs. We've never done those. Post-tension foundations, all kinds of stuff like that. We've never done those. And that where I was, uh, that's where I thought, man, I feel like we'd have to hire us. I think we don't even know if we'd be able to use our typical engineer. We'd have to use, you know, somebody else. So for me, for us, I think that's where we, we drew the line. So we were not awarded the contract and we were, we had, then we had, a, we actually had a phone call with the developer and he said, Hey, if you guys, he's actually a pretty good friend guy our age, but he was nice enough to say, hey, if you guys want to know why you didn't get it, I'd be happy to tell you, which honestly, I've been asking clients to give me this feedback since the beginning. And they're so, I found that they're so reluctant to do it. So we took him up on it. Alex and I called him and he said, oh, we just didn't, we just, we, they said, as a developer, as a new developer, he said, I've never, I've never done this typology before and i know you guys haven't so i seemed like a double whammy if we were doing it that way so i hired a firm that was more expensive than you just to be on the safe side um so now let's say let's say go down the road five years from now let's say he does another condo he's done one we maybe still haven't done one but i, th I think at that point i would even feel more comfortable jumping in the contract with him because at least he's done one so at least yep. half of the equation is there yeah so um the other one of the other projects that we did we, we never did, um, you know, so many townhomes. The developer never did so many townhomes. Yeah, so there, the, it was the, the double The contractor winning. never did as many townhomes. And I think that's maybe where it becomes a little bit more of a headache and, and craziness. Um, for these, the leaps, the more leaps that I want to take are if we're building it and doing it ourselves. Or if it's so big, if we ever entered a competition ever again in our life, um, and then somehow they picked us out of a million entries and it was a huge project then then maybe because we literally have to staff up to, yep. yeah yeah so the one an, one good example of a leap we took that is paying dividends now is the uh, one more is the is the group homes so the first group homes that I did um that I sort of head up in the firm I we'd never done one before but the contractor that was going to be on the building project had done them and so I was actually able to utilize his knowledge on that and then once we did one, well, then I kind of had the aha meeting with, like Alex did with this last one, which is a huge project for us. It's four of them. It's a, it's a $6 million project. And um, I, I was the expert in the room because these new developers had no idea what the heck they were doing. And they just wanted, they hired me to be the basically expert and, and the same contractor. So I don't know. I think it's worth it. But I think you have to, either one of the three people in the triangle has to have already done one. Maybe this is the sort of rules was, I'm making up now. There was another one that I turned down. Oh, the big one, uh, 150 unit condos, condos. Oh yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and I said, um, I go, well, I don't, I don't think it was that many units. Anyways, it was I, a lot. The architecture price. I go, if, if their architecture fee <laughs> literally is above 750,000, then call us. Because like, then I think, you know, we could save some money slash we could be in like the $400,000, $500,000 right. range. And, the caveat, and then we could hire exactly someone. Yeah. The caveat was that. And then I think, I think they were around half a million for architecture fees. So I was like, just go with them. They, they've done it. They've done it a million times, stuff like that. It'd be, you know, it'd be a little bit rough with us. Um, so, so yeah. go ahead. And, and I feel really good giving that advice because I think it's, it's honest is that if there is a firm that has way more experience and they're only... 20% more, 15% more, especially on a huge project where a 10% mistake 
is a whole bunch. And and one one thing I'll add to this is we're coming at this from the perspective of like we are in the middle of the hottest real estate market besides Houston in the United States right now. So we kind of have the luxury of choosing. If it was three years ago, we'd probably be exactly. So I just want to make that sharking those people. Exactly. I just want to make clear that uh, (laughs) it's easy for us to say now, but you know, five years down the road, let's say another giant recession hits. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows what we would do? But I think at least given some hindsight and some perspective on it. But I think our saving grace in that is that we might be so low on work that right now honestly our heads are a little bit split you know i got five six seven projects going you got five six seven projects going that if we are in a recession we might only have that so then we could literally just sit there and really focus really learn the codes do some study and stuff like that where now it you know we just can't spend all of our time on one project no matter what yeah yeah that's the truth so uh there you go there's some there's some feedback about that so uh, next thing I want to I was gonna I was gonna bring up today was file naming standards. So. Ooh, we're getting this is an exciting conversation. <laughs> How do you name your files, How folks? How do you name your files? Texas that five five five. <laughs> so Arc Daily had the audacity. Arc Daily probably is smart in the way they. I like Arc Daily, but I think they're smart in the way that they clickbait sometimes on article headings. So. If you go to their if you go to their Facebook page, one of the things they posted this week was um, how every every architect there's a graphic. If you go to uh, if you go to I think inside the firm too, the graphic is up there. How every architect in this world hashtag true story names their files. <laughs> every and, architect, awesome. Yeah, every architect, every yeah. architect. And so they were smart because they got they clickbaited me, and then I got all up in a tizzy all day yesterday <laughs> about it. Nice. <laughs> so. So, so I posted. You don't tell me how I name my files. Exactly. So here's what I posted on my personal page, and then actually in the Entree Architect community and um, on on LinkedIn and a couple places. So I said, "How do you name your files?" At our firm, we take a different approach and try to teach that approach to our students at CU Boulder as well. The approach is this: every file name should start with a date, and every day that you open the file, rename this file's date to reflect that date. Example of how we name files. 140406 underscore file name underscore file phase or 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 so what this means is like 17 is the year 04 is the month 06 is the day what we think it does is it keeps track of the actual most cur- current file rather than relying on like the computer to tell us because haven't you had this happen where you copy a file from one other place to another or you move time zones or something like that have you've seen that right where like the file date you're like i know that's not right Oh, you mean the file date that it automatically gives you? Yes, and and here's where it gets messed up too: is that sometimes you'll o- open, you'll make changes, and then you'll be like, "Oh, okay, I need to go back to this file and look because I need to either bring that change back in or just see what was going on because I deleted some stuff." So then you'll open a file from a month ago, and then then I've had even employees this open is up. Perfect, perfect. Yep. So that so so remember that as I continue this conversation. <laughs> So some people, <laughs> so I posted that on my personal page and my, my friends, my brother was like, oh, I use that too. And then a couple of other friends who, who are not architects and I posted it personally because I wanted to see like, are other people in other professions doing it? Lo and behold, they are. Even one of our good friends, Justin Miedema, um, said that he still uses it even though he's not an architect in his, in his new jobs and stuff like Shout that. Shout out Justin Miedema. So I think it's a great practice for anybody that uses digital files is na- just renaming them uh, per, per the date that you, that you did it with. You don't have to use our exact method and everything like that. So then, then I posted it, uh, in a, in another page that I'm on and with a bunch of other architects and got a crazy amount of, uh, responses. It was actually a great debate back and forth, but some people just thought I was preaching. I was not. And I was just, I was just, because I stated, like, tell us your method. How do you do it in, in this post? Uh, I think this awesome. start, starts, so I, starts out, how do you name your files? Right? I've only seen a some, but ha, do you have any funny? Embar- like, you don't have to say well, any first names. Of all, anyone shout, yell at you? First of all, shout out Evan Troxel again. He, 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 has an, he actually has a really good article that he points to. It's called The Best Way to Name Your Files. Um, if you go to, I think if you probably just Google it, I bet you'll, I bet you'll find it because the heading is so good. Uh, yeah, The Best Way to Name Your Files. I bet if you look for it, it's on the gitmethod.com blog. It's a it's a great way. It's pretty it's pretty similar to ours. I'll give you an example of the file name, and then yes, I do have some funny ones, because that was your question, right? Yeah. So here's so I, I said here's an example of how the, that file would be named. Twenty twelve dash zero six dash two eight. So kind of close to ours, right? And then 
and then it names like the file name. In this case, it's like something library, what phase it's in, oh. and then what the model is. So still real close. So phase SD dash exterior massing model. Yeah. So it's really de super descriptive. But then he has an 04 out of there. So is that for model four? I think so. Because if it was iteration four, I'd be like, Evan. Yeah. And just to re go back to the beginning of this whole conversation, what Arc Daily was claiming is that architects, and we did this in school, and we tell people this when we teach them at CU, CU Boulder, is we used to say, okay, this is you know new design. And then it's oh, yeah. save as new, new design. And then new, 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 new design. And then final. New final design, final, final, new design. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but I don't so, think, what's, what's weird is that no one told us this in, in school. Exactly. I'm, so that's my point. Huh. That's my point. And so... Um, that's my that you know that's what I'm saying is I'm just saying and don't you can use your own method and you could you could not rename every day or something like but some people were in a tissy and they said um, they said uh, what a nightmare this would be uh, let me see if I can find it right here you don't have to rename it every day too you don't have to rename it every day you don't have to I, I'm not even preaching I'm not saying but like where I where this was interesting feedback that I got from people so if they have linked rabbit files. They were like, "Oh, that would be a nightmare," and I actually agree that would that would be a nightmare. But yes. I thought it was like this. I thought you could rename every day, and then it you just have to, you know, Revit won't find that exact name, but you just repoint it to the path of that file. It doesn't reorient it or everything. It keeps it in the exact same place. Oh yeah, so it's not a problem. Like it's actually not a problem. You you open it up, but here's the extra step that is a quote unquote nightmare. You go to manage your links and then you just say relink and then you just have to click the newest one. So you have to remember and tell everyone every day or whatever, go redo it and do yeah. that extra step. Yeah. So that's the only nightmare. So it could work. The, f the funny response I got, and I actually want to do this at our firm is, is that uh, um, there was a guy that said the exact same, does the exact same method as us. And he says, uh, and if, and if he catches the words new or final on any file, then you owe the firm five dollars to go towards the next office lunch. <laughs> so I think that's a great rule. <laughs> but what yeah. I want, what I, so why I'm telling you about this is, I was, I think it's, I think it's pertinent to practice, no matter what kind of professional thing you're doing, right, digitally. But you and Fernando wanted to change our system, not the file name, the folder system. The folder system. Sorry. So I'm kind, uh, I'm testing it out um, because you know people can evolve so cur currently what we do is the same the same way we name our files the same way we name our folders we start with the date we start with the f no that's not what we're changing no 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 oh okay yeah but, but I, I understand that but I'm just telling I just okay yeah so the like the master folder is name and then project title and then at the end is a description like is it architecture is it BIM whatever yep and then we go into the file structure that Alex wants to change yep so then you get into the file so that's staying the same so then you get into the folder structure and how we currently have it is that we have a Revit folder we have a written folder we have a Photoshop folder a CAD folder a CAD folder is that I think it? that's it that's it okay so <clears throat> what's crazy about that is that if if you're bringing a and then in the written we have PDF in and then the Photoshop is just Photoshop. Yep. So if written, you, written, PD, written in the written folder is PDF in and PDF out. Yep. But <laughs> for PDF out, we don't really use that. We use, yeah, why is PDF out? Why you are both of the PDFs? I don't know. In, this, is why, this is why I'm bringing it up. Maybe we, maybe this is kind of a learning experience for you. Maybe our folder system is screwed up. So, so the PDF in and out should probably be moved to the Photoshop folder maybe. because that seems like the more image base, right? Mm-hmm. So our Revit folder has PDF out, right? But PDF in is only in written, but sometimes it's like engineering stuff. So why put it, why put it in there? And then also there's CAD. So then like in CAD, we have to have CAD in, right? But normally when you get something from an engineer, it's the PDF and the CAD. So normally, honestly, people just put it in the same place. So normally it's in either the Photoshop for some reason, or it's in written PDF in yeah. for some yeah, reason. Yeah, you see, you, see, you see why I'm bringing this up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Fernando's new idea, which, which is growing on me, is that you open up the folder and then there's in, working, and out. Which I, which I'm also leaning, to, I'm getting on board with this too. It took me a while. Yeah. Like so concept. then in the in folder, I have in from city, I have in from planning department. In from anybody. It, yeah. But, but then in from engineer, in from civil, yeah. in from, so then you break it down and then anytime you're like, oh, David sent me something or whatever, like, you know where to go. 
Okay. Then there's the working folder. Right? Then there's the working. So like that's, there's the Revit folder. You can have like all your notes, your word documents, stuff like that. And then there's the out. And what I like about this out too, is that, um, you can, if I'm, if I'm doing stuff for the civil, okay, I need a, a, a the site plan. I need a section. I need all that stuff. If it was in the old, it would be in Revit and then like it'd be the, the file name and then civil. But let's say I'm exporting a bunch of different things and let's say I'm exporting something from like the, the this is, hey, hey, here's notes from the city. So when I'm attaching it, I need to go to multiple different folders to find all this stuff because there's no other way to do it. So like I have to double click where on this one, the out, I can make a folder in there that says today's date to civil. And then I can export things to that. I can copy stuff and put it in there if I'm making stuff for the city. And here's what's good too, is that let's say there's something for the city that I'm done with, right? It's not sitting um, in PDF out at some date, whatever. I can put it in there and then just keep adding to that folder. That one folder, yeah. That one folder. So that's why I like it because then right. it, it's hard to wrap your mind around, okay, where are stuff? Because the main question is, okay, is it in the working or is it in the in? And then where, but, but, I think I think there's solutions to and all And again, this, this is only our idea. Take you don't we're not preaching, we're just saying this is our idea. I I'm sure everybody has their own I would love to hear from more people. Me too. I would love to. And G graphically if possible. Graphically just if possible. Just like screenshots of the of your screen. Or if you can record your voice, send a screenshot and then send us a, a MP3. Send us you talking about how it works. Uh, yeah, and why it works well for you. Um, I, because like, as you can see, we're, we're open to, to changing uh, and hearing from everybody else, but we're open internally to our own methods like changing. I, I'm actually kind of on board with like, let's see how this goes. Exactly. With the, with, and so the, the project we're doing this in is our own development project. The rest of them stay current F9 yeah. standards. So. But do you get the, the benefit with, with the city oh. submissions? Like you can keep, because, yes. because then if you train, if you, right, I buy, I buy the whole thing. If you trained your mind, yep. if you know that like, okay, this is the system we're working in. Yep. Because once, you know, there's a response to all these city, like, Hey, make sure you do this. Once I get that done, it's going in there. And then I don't have to remember where it is because I know that it's ready to rock. Okay. One last thing that somebody brought up yesterday that was, that was a good point was <clears throat> this guy says the last sheet in every set is my C1 sheet for comments and revisions. I add the date and then list any changes when they were generated and it saved my boss's butt one time when an owner decided to sue him. Huh. The lawyer asked why there were so many changes. I flipped to the last page and said, you can read about it here. Every date and every requested request by the owners that pretty much needed ended the conversation when the lawyer realized his own, his owner called every other day to make changes during permitting and during construction. What do you think about that? I love it. Me so too. does he probably not include it when he exports his PDF, but I want to know how he implements it. So maybe you can ask him and maybe he can send maybe just us a screenshot. Oh, I could ask him that question. <laughs> because do you put on this date client ask like, do you put the actual email? Like do you snip out the email or do you just reiterate and retype what happened? Yeah. I don't know. So I, I will follow up. I will follow up with this gentleman and, and ask him what he said, but because I thought it was really interesting. Some of our projects, I have guys taking like detailed notes. Um, Jackson does it the best. And then, yeah. oh yeah, he does. So then here's the, so in further down the conversation, and then he goes, the other nice thing on a regular project is it records municipality questions, even they're ridiculous ones. We all have been through that. <laughs> so when they look at my plans, now they know there will be a permanent record of what they commented on. The contractors also have a record of why something on the plans is if they that see, so he does put it he does export it yeah okay so I, I actually why not when so the first part of his you know when he said he just records that so it's a dialogue between him and the city great i don't know how everybody else does it, but we do written responses back and forth um it, separate from drawings so there's a written record but when he said the last sentence i was like oh that makes so much sense because i i i instantly thought when I, when i read that sentence there's been so many times contractors have called me and they're like, why are we doing this? And then I always have to go, because the city. Here, here's what's also cool about that too, because sometimes you can't always get a written response from them. But let's say you're in the folder and you call up, I'm going to say uh, Beth from the city. You say, this storm drain. Can we name her Becky instead? Becky, Becky, <laughs> Becky. Um, hey, this storm drain, uh, we don't need it for whatever reason, yeah. right? And then she's like, yes, we don't need it. And then you hang up the phone and you instantly write that 
on your little, you, you date it, phone call with, with Becky, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then let's say you do your due diligence and you, you send her an email and let's say she never confirms and you know, you don't get a response or let's say, um, you forget, you forget. There's something more powerful about like, it's written here and most people are honest. So they'd be like, oh, I did say that. So I did say that. And it's not on a word document. It's, it's basically because these are contract documents. That's what they're called. Yep. And I'll give you another example. Um, I won't name names, but I had a professor that was semi crazy in construction management school. Um, but crazy in, in, in both ways. Like she was at another university and she totally redid their whole construction management program. And she did it logically. Like instead of having like each class isolated in its own silo, she did, we're just going to model every class like a big project. So like you will get through like a huge project and you'll get into more detail as you go along. It's very logical, very great. And she's like, I take, and she used to work for like huge companies making like oil platforms and stuff like that. He goes, you should do this, which I don't do. She's like every day. I, I can't kind of do it because I have my own schedule and stuff like that. Every day I write down what I do. So like I think at like noon and then at three, like, Oh, from nine to whatever I did this, I had a phone call with this person. I had, you know, this is this, this. And then she goes, whenever we'd get, you know, sued or in trouble, just open that up open to that, that day up. and it was written down and it was like Bob c called me and said do not put that washer there and it exploded boom you know and I'm like oh okay guess Bob's in trouble yep yeah. yep so I actually want to try the C so here's how I think it would be seamless for us to, to start implementing this is when we do get plan responses back from the city let's just do the written part right on a sheet and call it call out a day so no more letters, no more written, no more actual, you know, letters and word documents like, nope, goes on a sheet now. And then we do our plan responses that way back to everybody. And we direct, we actually direct the planners and everybody like, oh, you know, go to the sheet. This is how we work. This is how it works every time. Because they want a written response anyway. I think it's, I think it's genius. I don't know how we had even thought about it before. Uh, okay. So when the city, when we went to our meeting for our initial meeting, they had a whole bunch of stuff. So for our project. Let's just put it right put on, it on there. Are we retyping their comments or are we doing the snippet where we like cut their comment out and then paste it on there? For, for those ones, I think it could be a snippet. Yeah. For sure. I don't see the point in retyping them. Yeah. 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 If you just copy paste an image yep. and then maybe ours. So like uh, I think the same thing applies for when we get future comments back. Sometimes they just give us PDFs. What did, she, what did he name it? He named it C C1. Yeah. C1. I think it's comment sheet. I love comment it. Sheet. I love it too. Yeah. Now for, for clients, I don't know. We don't have too many right now. All of our clients are really good. Like there's no, we haven't had anybody really complain about changes and stuff like that. Cause they just know, they just know what could get in the weeds there too. Is that, so I, we just had a meeting and it was, Hey, move this door over here, put this over here, put that, you know, I marked it up on, on a sheet, you know, all that I'd, to write all that down is kind of, I don't know. It take they'll take another hour. I don't even it. think we have the fees for it, but yeah. for the city, I think let's just start. Let's just I'll just start it and try it. Yeah, yeah. comment. Okay, comment cool. Sheet. Cool. Oh, cool. Awesome. cool idea. Cool idea. Uh, see, look what happens. When you just put listen to inside the firm. <laughs> <laughs> well, not so much that, but <laughs> ask. Uh, I'm actually sometimes I'm okay with opinions <laughs> yeah. when I ask for them. So uh, next up, uh, we're gonna hear um, right hear from our, our good friend Mark Mark LePage. Hey guys, this is Mark R. LePage, founder of Entree Architect. The worst advice I ever received was that architects don't market themselves. I was told years and years ago that architects don't market themselves. That's beneath us. We're artists. Well, if we want to build better businesses, if we want to build strong, successful, thriving careers, we need to learn the fundamentals of business and marketing and sales are foundations, are fundamentals of business. And the best advice I've ever received in my career, build your network. Connect people you know with other people who can make a difference in their lives. Best advice I ever got is build your network. Thanks for letting me share a little bit of my knowledge on your show. You're doing a great job with Inside the Firm. Keep up the great work. Okay. I, th I thought that was great. Thanks, Mark. I got a couple thoughts on that. So the worst advice, um, we believe also that ar architects don't market themselves. And we think it's because, um, I don't know. I think they think that it's sleazy. They think that it's sleazy. 
Well, like like Mark said, they think it's beneath them because they're artists. Yeah, exactly. Um, so so I just I would just say I would support everything he said. I would parrot it and say, just market yourself, just market yourself. Go ahead and do it unapologetically. Yeah, unapologetically. Like, I, and admittedly, as an unapologetic uh, marketer myself, I'm much more active on social media than than Alex is. But my point with that is, is like, um, I do sometimes like have these moments where I'm just walking around in my house where I'm like, man, I spent, I spent too much time like talking about us and ourselves and like, look at me, look at me, look at us, yeah. look at us, look at us. I <laughs> Everybody has those. I think know that even the people who are most unapologetic, that's my point. Yeah. They also have that self-reflection, but like, don't worry. It's okay. It's okay. And you should go out there and put yourself out there. It, if you're doing cool stuff, tell everybody about it. Why not? Yeah. It's better than bad news. It's better than negative news. Yep. Um, so do that. And then we just gave a, uh, expert lecture to Mark's, uh, private group and we put a lot of effort into it and I think it went well. And one of the things that we said is that do a fun project a year and then really market that. But what's cool about that is that people have this, they're afraid of marketing. So what if you started out as just, I think there's separate avenues. I think there's more of the business marketing. Like literally you can pay for advertising. You can pay to promote stuff and you absolutely should. That's a lit- That's how we got clients back in the day through Google is that we paid to be, you know, like on the side there. Um, but then if you're afraid of that or, or, or just want to supplement it, do a project that you love, do something that's really, really great. Um, that's very personal to you. And then you shouldn't be ashamed of marketing that because you should, it, you should talk about it naturally. You know, if you're not spreading negative things, I don't think you should be ashamed of, of, of spreading, spreading the things that you're doing positively. It just, it's so obvious to me. Yep. And then build your network. How do you do that? I have two ways, but you, you want me to go or you, you got some ideas? Uh, well, you could traditionally go down and join the chamber of commerce. Yep. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, how do we build your network? Uh, f- well for me, for me, I am an internet guy and every day on, on LinkedIn, I connect with as many people as I can on a puddle that I, that I don't even know. I've grown my network. I've doubled it in the last three weeks. I don't even think I've told you that it went from 800 to almost 1600. And so our spread there is bigger. Like for me, it's just connecting, connecting. Now I'm on a rampage of like Facebook connecting. I'm, I'm connecting with people I've never even met, but I've seen posts in, in other forums and stuff like that. Um, because I know at least I've looked at them and saying like, ah, oh, they're not negative people. The most negative people that I have connected with on social media are people that I grew up with. Yeah. I'm not joking. At the end of the day, I get, I've gotten more arguments with them on, on social media than people I do not know. So I think you have to go out there and, and connect with people that share at least some of your ideology. So for me, politically, if, you know, I'm, a, I'm a libertarian, and unapolog- I'm unapologetically, so I go out there and I actually network with those people now online and friend them. And I, there's no arguments. Like We generally agree. We generally lift each other up. Same thing with the architect community. The entree architect community has been phenomenal for networking. So yep. you have to find, like, there's got to be some kind of ideology. But I think it is actually people you maybe have grown up with and already have a preconceived notion of who you are. Yep. And then the second thing is that how do you go deeper with that? So I think that's your platform. And then two, uh, I think you, you just try to give, you just try to give. So like we try to give with, with this, with this, uh, podcast, with our information, all that kind of stuff. But let's say you're trying to target a specific person, feel free to tweet, email, call. Well, probably not call (laughs) because I don't want phone calls. (laughs) I don't think don't call people. Um, but, but email them. And then give them something of value. So um, one thing I just did, do you remember uh, Eric from Oz? Yes. So I there was a great podcast, and it was about how DuPont saved a whole bunch of millions, millions and millions of dollars. They had this challenge um, where basically anyone could submit an idea. And if that idea saved $200,000 at DuPont, which is huge, oh. they do it. And they've saved like... $40 million like a year. And then basically if your idea gets submitted, you can lead that. So if someone sees something like, Oh man, this could be so much better, you know? And, and if it really is fact that you will save that money, bam, now you're in charge, you're doing it. It's awesome. So for us, I don't know how much that work because we're such a small firm, mm-hmm. but I go, Hey, Oz would like that. They're Oz a big, would like they're a big yeah. firm. Mm-hmm. Email them. Don't even, don't even have a response and, yet. And not even any expectations. Yep. Yep. No response. And then I pointed him to the podcast. Um, where was it on? It was on 
maybe I'll put a link to it. I'll find where it was and I'll, and I'll put a link to it. Um, so go go to insidethefirm.com in the show notes. You'll see what I'm talking about. And for, the, for this podcast where they talk about the DuPont idea. Yep. Okay. Yep. So uh, feel free to share tips. And the tips should be, you know, don't find something like just like a random post and say, hey, hey, whatever. I think you'd like this. Like you need to, it needs to be in your area of expertise. Um so let's say you heard something like on this podcast and you know someone who's tr- trying to do a development or something like that. It would, one, it would help us obviously. So it's kind of selfish, but, but I think it's in the vein of, of, uh, you know, doing good, share that with them and say, Hey, listen to this podcast or here's a snippet or this would answer your question. Or I know you've been thinking about this. Um, and, and, and just, just pass it along again. Don't expect anything because people are busy. Who knows? Um, it might go in their spam. Um, some people are so busy. Don't take it. Don't take it bad if they don't respond. Um, especially if you're trying to connect with some bigger guys, thousands of emails. So don't take it bad whatsoever, but at least you're putting out a good vibe. And especially if you know something that can help someone like just, just share it. Yeah. 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 On the ground, a couple ideas that we've had, um, for, for networking, which we are still going to pursue once we find the time is we always thought, We've all, so realtors, I think they are such a valuable resource for architects if you haven't already thought about it. So my fiance is a realtor and we refer work to her, like people that are looking to buy land. And she um, is, you know, the idea is she, she, she refers work back to us, which she is doing because we're meeting with the developer later today. Um, so getting in, fr- you wouldn't believe, so they have like with her office every Friday, they have guest speakers come in. And they just talk about what they do. So they could be insurance people, lawyers, all kinds of stuff. So we've had the idea of why don't we put together a little brochure and we say, tell the realtors, hey, if you know anybody, you know, here's what we do. Um, here's how we do it well. Um, here's why you should hire us. And then here's how people can get a hold of us if you believe us. Because, uh, you know, they always, they're, they're helping people buy and sell land. They're helping people buy and sell houses. And when people buy houses, a lot of times they, they might have bought the house. Like in the market here in Denver, people are buying houses and they're not ideal for them because the market, there's so little stock available. So we are doing so many additions and pop tops in Denver right now, just because people are like, this is all I could get. It's not perfect. And, but I got it. And now I need to remodel it. I need an architect. Um, so networking with as many realtors as you can and just pitching back and forth to them. But I think you, when you go into those meetings, you always have to have something like a carrot ready for them. And the carrot is I'm an architect. And people ask me, you know, former clients or whatever, like that they're looking for land. So maybe, you know, you you say like, yeah, I talk with, I speak with developers all the time and they're always looking for land and to engage and stuff like that. So if I, if I get the chance, I'll refer them to you. Yeah. So nice. That's all I got. That's all I got for the referral part. Do you have anything else? Nope. Okay. Uh, for the next podcast, we, this one ran crazy long, which is, which is good uh, for you guys, yeah. if you're listening. Um, we were going to talk about uh, current contract negotiations and three different kinds of proposals, one which is brand new to us that, got, that, we've, that we've seen. And so <clears throat> surprise pricing versus fixed pricing, and then a straight surprise up Surprise pricing. That sounds yeah, interesting. Surprise pricing. Yeah. Uh, this is a brand new concept that we, we saw in short, what would happen? Well, uh, no, 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 leave it. Oh, leave, leave it? it? Okay. Leave it. So it's a surprise about surprise pricing. I, I'm interested to see if anybody else listening to this also does it. And I would love to hear from them. Um, last thing is development talk. Where but, are we at? Um, the, not too much. Uh, w- we'll catch up on it next week. Um, let you know. Alex got some signs and that was it. I got some signs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll see you guys next week. Yep. Bye.